you so much. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the sanctuary uh, for having me here tonight. So I, I obviously come from the independent media world. I believe in it very strongly. Uh, I sort of got my start in journalism when I I quit a straight newspaper uh, because they wouldn't let me write uh, the way I wanted to, and um, I ended up sort of starting and co-starting and funding a newspaper in Moscow, Russia uh, for six years. Um, and then after that, I tried to start a paper up in Buffalo. It didn't go so well. Um, but I'm a strong believer uh, that independent media is, is greatly needed and that there's an enormous corrupting influence uh, when you mix big money uh, and big media. And um, it's actually fortuitous that I'm here to talk about Insane Clown President because this book is actually quite a lot about the media and what happens when things go wrong with the major media. And uh, it, a lot of this book is about uh, how developments that have been sort of in the run, in the works for a long time in the commercial news media led to the election of Donald Trump. Um, there's been, there have been revolutionary changes uh, in our business and I think a lot of people uh, who don't follow the media probably aren't aware of a lot of these things and that's really what I, what I want to talk about tonight largely is, a, is a, are, are things that the ordinary person doesn't really know about what's gone on uh, in this business and how those things have led to some of the political changes that we um, are unfortunately living through today. Um, when I was a kid, and when I'm sure a lot of the people in this audience, uh, when they were kids, there were uh, only three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, three major networks, and when those three networks agreed, on a thing, and that's what a fact was. Uh, and everybody knew what was true and what wasn't, or at least they agreed uh, on what they thought was true and what wasn't, and the country was able to have a dialogue with each, with its, uh, each other because um, there was a common set of facts that everybody was debating. Um, but a little over a decade ago, uh, with the growth of the internet, uh, on the one hand, and some rather conspicuous failures, uh, in terms of factual accuracy by uh, major news organizations on the other, the public started to lose confidence in this old sort of monopolistic news media system. And they started to consume the news in a different way. And instead of letting reporters tell them what was true and what wasn't, uh, they started going online and deciding for themselves what was true. And factual reality sort of stopped being this thing that was dictated uh, from on high and became something that people could essentially shop for. Uh, if you didn't agree with the way things were portrayed in the quote unquote mainstream media, you could go online and seek out your own version of the truth. And people became reality shoppers on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, and we started to see the rise uh, of a lot of conspiratorial movements and I don't need to go into what, the, what those are, but people will prob probably be familiar with them. And uh, many years ago, about a decade ago, in fact, I wrote a book about this, this phenomenon, and I worried a lot about where all this was headed. Uh, the book was called The Great Derangement. And a lot of what that book was about was sort of this breakdown in trust in the traditional media and what that would mean for politics going forward. And one of the things I said was that we were entering an era where politics would be less a fight over policy and more a fight over information. Uh, the candidate who would be able to sell the most attractive version of reality would be the one who would be the most successful. And uh, I wasn't thinking of Donald Trump back then. Donald Trump wasn't thinking of Donald Trump back then. Uh, this was strictly a feeling about where politics is headed, that it was, um, it was headed to a place uh, where it was this dangerous place where voters couldn't agree anymore on, on what the, the terms of the debate were. And I thought even back then that if somebody could come along who was clued into this, this very strange dynamic of what we now kind of in the press refer to as the post-factual era, um, that that person would be very, very successful. And Donald Trump ended up being that person. And he upended a lot of the traditional formulas for how you win elections in this country. Uh, and some of those things actually weren't entirely negative. 
there were a lot of bad things about how, how elections were run in this country, and they've changed forever, not necessarily in a good way, but that doesn't mean that the old way was good either. Uh, in the old days in America, uh, the roadmap to success uh, in presidential elections was really pretty simple. Uh, whoever raised the most money won uh, almost 95% of the time in national elections. And uh, that was for a variety of reasons, uh, among other things because um, the raising of a lot of money was a signal to the political establishment, which included news reporters who covered political media, uh, that a person who raised a lot of money had the approval of the political establishment of the country, and that person had therefore, would therefore earn the approval of the news media and would get positive news coverage. So it turned into a very simple formula. Raise money, get good press, buy commercials, and then win. That was really the, the, the formula for winning elections in this country for decades and decades and decades. Trump sort of turned this formula on its head. Uh, he bypassed all of those ideas about how you're supposed to win uh, elections. Uh, and instead, he kind of made running against that reality part of his act. And since the press was an, uh, an intimate part of that old formula of how people got elected, he also ran against the media as well. And he was extremely effective in doing that. And the, the public's hatred of the news media and their belief in us as a corrupted part of the political establishment was a huge key to Trump's own success, uh, his own problem uh, in selling himself as an accessible person because we were less accessible than Donald Trump was because the public hated us more than they hated New York billionaires like Donald Trump. Uh, he was able to present himself as sort of a quote unquote common man. Um, but uh, here I sort of want to back up a little bit and talk about presidential campaigning in general and how it worked. Um, and some of the things that Trump pointed out and talked about on the campaign trail and some of the things that were affected, effective for him. Um, I've covered now uh, four presidential elections for Rolling Stone and I was in sort of a unique position to watch how it works. Uh, there are a couple of things I gotta talk about here about how, how presidential campaigning works. Um, the few things a lot of people don't know, one thing is that the people who are on the campaign plane or quote unquote on the bus, uh, has anyone here read the book, The Boys in the Bus? Yeah, a few people, right? So that's sort of the, the generic term the reporters use for the people who, who travel with the candidates and the press corps. Uh, that's, that's, we call that on the bus, right? And what, do you, what is true about on the people on the bus is that it's a very select group of people. Um, and uh, notably, there's basically no independent or alternative media in that group. Now, why is that? People don't really think about this, but it's true. The reason is it's just too expensive. Um, covering presidential election campaigns is an incredibly expensive affair. Uh, it's complicated, but basically the, in order to travel with the, with the candidates, the campaigns charge uh, the press um, they charter their own airplanes, they charter their own hotels, and then they charge this enormous markup. Uh, for everybody to travel with them. And so just to give you an example, my last trip with Donald Trump was a three-day trip, and my bill was over $12,000. So if you think about that, uh, that automatically excludes a whole class of people who could never, ever travel with, with presidential campaigns. They're only a certain kind of reporter is going to be there, and only a, a, within that subset of people there's only a small, small group of people who can travel every day for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months on end. So it's only that specific small uh, subset of sort of corporate funded media that's on, on the plane. Uh, the, of those people, the schedule for reporters has gotten drastically different in the last 12 to 16 years. Back in the 70s and 80s, newspaper reporters who traveled on the plane, uh, the toughest schedule they usually had was to file maybe at most once a day. You had to write one article a day if you were on the plane. When the, the, uh, the internet came along, that changed. People who worked for the major dailies suddenly had to not only write uh, stories for the print edition, but they had to do two, three, four, five web ups updates a day. Uh, and the people who worked for the cable news stations, uh, instead of doing one report for the six o'clock news broadcast or the 11 o'clock broadcast, 
uh, they were doing five, six, seven, eight, nine hits a day, uh, and they were constantly, constantly working. And if anybody's ever read about cults like Aum Shinriko or anything like that, one of the things that they tell you is that uh, working people constantly and, and keeping them sleep deprived is a way of uh, sapping their will and, and reducing their ability to think critically. And this is something that happens absolutely on the campaign trail. A, a typical schedule uh, for a reporter, and also for the politicians, interestingly enough, uh, especially when you get into the second half of a presidential campaign, is um, you leave a hotel at 5.30 or 6 in the morning, uh, you will follow the candidate, you'll be writing constantly. As soon as the candidate says anything, you start writing your, your, a story. At the end of every event, they herd you into a little room called the filing room, you do your work, you go, from a, uh, you go back to a bus, you go onto a plane, you repeat the process three or four times, and you don't get to your hotel uh, until 11 or 12 o'clock that night, and then you re repeat it all over again. And for most people, they're writing or reporting pretty much constantly from the time they wake up in the morning until the time they go to sleep, and then they're waking up again the next day at six o'clock. And that was pretty much everybody in the plane who, covers, uh, who covered presidential elections except me. Um, because I, as a magazine writer, and there are very few magazine writers who regularly cover presidential campaigns, my deadline was once every six weeks, every two months. <laughs> and so they would herd all the reporters into these filing rooms, and while everybody else is sitting there furiously clacking away, um, I would be doing nothing. In fact, the first time uh, I went on, the, on these trips, I actually got in trouble. Uh, with some of the other reporters because I was too loudly flipping the pages of a Sports Illustrated. <laughs> um, at another stop in Houston, uh, they busted me for using a, having a Rubik's Cube, which they found annoying. So for actually two or three election cycles, uh, I had oceans of time where I would just sit watching how, how the press operated and how elections operated. Uh, and I was essentially sort of commanded not to make a sound and just sit there for a long time. And of course I took notes during the events but, and interviewed people, but for, for a lot of the time I just sat there. And I had, unlike everybody else, I had a lot of time to think about, well, what is it we're actually doing? What is campaigning? What is, how does the campaign trail work? What is this activity we're actually engaged in? And it's a lot weirder than you think if you actually sit down and think about it. One of the things I started to think about, and there there's sort of five observations I want to get to, but one of them is about the financial dynamic in the plane. Uh, most reporters don't think about it, but there are two sets of people in the plane. There's the politicians who are in the front of the plane, and it's interesting how it's sort of geographically separate, separated this way. The politicians, the politicians' aides, the, the donors, uh, the pollsters, uh, they're up in the front, uh, and they have a very simple, financial arrangement, they get paid a lot of money by big corporate donors and it's a pretty obvious quid pro, uh, quid pro quo there. They um, get a lot of money and in return they're going to at some point deliver uh, some policy favors down the line. Now in the back of the plane uh, is us, the news media, and we have a completely different financial dynamic. We're all trying to get uh, ratings, eyeballs, hits, subscriptions, and we're trying to impress advertisers uh, by racking up statistics along those lines. So the, there's a tendency, uh, there's a dynamic that starts to develop in the, in, the, in the plane where reporters, whether they like it or not, whether they're conscious of it or not, they will unconsciously eventually start to gravitate towards candidates who are entertaining because candidates uh, who can help them achieve their financial mission and, and make their editors happy uh, will make their lives e easier. And their lives are tough already. A again, the, the schedule is really, really hard. So you're looking for angles that you don't have to fight with your editor about. Uh, you, you just want to write something that you know is going to go through the first try. Uh, and so reporters in the plane gravitate whether they know it or not, towards the, the people who are good with the media, who are easy on television, uh, who, aren't, who, don't have, um, who aren't too dry. If you go back in time and look at uh, uh, media descriptions of people like 
uh, Dennis Kucinich, uh, and even John Kerry, but particularly Kucinich, Ron Paul is another one. Um, you'll see a lot of descriptions like uh, bookish, uh, professorial, uh, and they don't, they always mean it as a negative when they're saying these things. And, and the, 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 they have these very uh, sort of, it's sort of a code that they use to try to describe people who aren't entertaining. Whereas the candidates who are good in front of the camera and who are entertaining, they get all these descriptors like warm, nuanced, uh, relaxed, uh, and anyway, there's a, there's a sort of a whole language that we use um, to kind of speak in code about the kind of candidates that we're looking for. And what I sort of learned over time is that the nominee ultimately is almost always a person who, the person who best synergizes these two financial dynamics that are existing in the plane. Uh, he or she must be, what's the word that's kind, uh, morally flexible enough. <laughs> Uh, on the one hand, to be the kind of person who is able to raise $100 million from corporate donors, uh, and only a certain kind of person is going to get that money. And on the other hand, it has to be a candidate who uh, satisfies the press's sort of unconscious need and desire for a, a, an entertaining product that they can sell. Um, and we ultimately came up with this sort of private, almost like a fraternity code language to describe what it is that we're looking for. The, the, that, that hidden quality of the person who synergizes those two dynamics, we, we, we came up with a word to describe it. We called it electability. All right? And if you look back at, um, at campaign coverage dating back decades, you'll see that there's a sort of endless quest to decide who's electable and who isn't. Uh, and they will, you'll find all these really strange descriptions of people who, who aren't electable, and the reasons will be really, really strange. Like, you know, Dennis Kucinich was r routinely described as someone who was too short and too funny looking to be president. Um, uh, Howard Dean uh, was unelectable because he was pointed. Uh, that was a word they used to, about him a lot. Uh, he was unorthodox, they said, and this was back uh, in the old days. Um, before his sort of transformation to, into a sort of mainstream Democrat, but he, he uh, back when he was getting all of his money from in, uh, small internet donations at the outset of his campaign, and when he was against the war, uh, they invented this whole code language to describe all the different ways that, that people like Dean were inadequate and not, not electable, right? And so the, the whole purpose of campaign coverage became this quest essentially by a priesthood, like a, or like high school heathers, right, <laughs> to figure out who the appropriate popular kid was going to be for, for, the, for the nomination. And, and we, as the me news media, we, we, we sort of dove into this idea that, we, that it was, we were in this king-making role, that it was our job to decide who was the right person and who was the wrong person. Uh, and without really being aware of it, we, we started to think of ourselves as the, peop as the people who made that decision for voters. Um, now Trump was different uh, in a couple of ways. He didn't owe uh, donors in the same way that, um, uh, that politicians traditionally did. Now, of course, he, when he came into office, one of the first things he did is he, he put every big business swine that he could possibly find into, uh, into high office and he, despite the fact that he said that he, he, he knew the people from Goldman Sachs and couldn't stand them and Ted Cruz was in their pocket and he wasn't, he of course puts five Goldman Sachs people in the cabinet within 10 minutes of becoming president, but he, as, a, as a candidate he didn't owe the donors and that made him different. Um, but on the other score, he massively satisfied the press's uh, desire for an, for an entertaining product uh, and the, despite the fact that he was unorthodox in this other way, in the, in the funding way, uh, the press responded to him almost immediately as somebody who was an answer to a lot of their, of their financial problems. And this is, a, this is an issue that has continued uh, to this day, and I'll get to this later. Um, and before, I think, reporters even knew what had happened, in the early stages of the campaign, when uh, politicians traditionally need to, to buy their own publicity, uh, Trump had probably already received a billion dollars in free coverage 
uh, before, before New Hampshire even. Uh, so at this incredibly crucial period of, of the campaign, when uh, typically people are weeded out for a couple of reasons, but usually because they're not able to raise enough money, Trump survived and went forward almost entirely because he, he satisfied the financial demands of our business. Um, the flip side to this is that although the press uh, gets into its role of deciding who's electable and, and, uh, and who isn't, and uh, usually that expresses itself in the press approving of a certain candidate, a person who is, who is boring enough uh, in the right ways uh, to be you know, electable, um, you know, they, they will decide that a certain kind of candidate isn't, isn't right for the camera, doesn't look like a president, isn't, isn't quote unquote presidential. Uh, when, when a candidate steps over the line and the people and the reporters in the plane decide that this person can no longer be president because they've done something wrong, uh, they, we typically go through this maneuver that another reporter described to me as the seal of death. Um, and if you go back and think about it, there are countless instances of this where uh, a candidate will do something stupid, um, get caught in a scandal, or just do something dumb on camera, and the press will sort of pig pile on the candidate with uh, an avalanche of negative coverage for a couple of days on end. Um, and usually that wipes out the candidate. Uh, an early example might be Ed Muskie crying in New Hampshire, for anybody who can remember that. Uh, Gary Hart, does anyone remember the, mo the monkey business photo uh, in the 80s? Uh, and then Howard Dean Scream, I think, was, the, was sort of the great modern example of this. Uh, I looked it up actually in the first two days after, after Dean Scream. Uh, the, the tape was played by local television stations uh, in America something like 660 times in the first 48 hours. And so it was sort of viral media before viral media uh, and Trump was basically seal of death out of the race. And it, 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 some reporters and I, and read, I write about this in the book, we talk about the, whole, the stages of how that usually goes. This script is so well known to reporters that we, we, we actually know how this goes in advance. The, we do the seal of death, um, then there's a, an abashed public apology, uh, always the, the, the candidate. Uh, will will apologize or try to go explain his or her behavior, uh, and then there's a, what we call a dead man walking period, where as the as the candidate plunges in the polls uh, and sort of tries to soldier on bravely for two or three weeks, um, usually getting increasingly angry uh, as the as the press follows them less and less, uh, and then finally, like three or four weeks later, there's a, you know the, the sort of humiliating. Uh, exit, or the anticlimactic withdrawal, we call it, uh, where you'll see a page 16 notice, you know, so-and-so withdraws from race uh, after, you know, getting 3% in New Hampshire or something like that. That's, a, that's the script of how this usually works. And Trump was the first person to, to defy uh, this script. Um, and this happened over and over and over again early in the campaign, really starting the first day of his campaign, when he, he you know he had that whole line about um, you know they're bringing Mexican they're bringing rapists over the border they're bringing the worst people uh, the press wasn't it, I would say that they they weren't completely in seal of death mode at that moment but they certainly were um, a few weeks later when uh, he had his remarks about John McCain I'm sure you all remember the, you know I, I prefer people who weren't captured uh, it was the universal assessment of people. Uh, in the news media that this was not a survivable comment, um, that you can say bad things about Mexicans, but you can't say bad things about veterans in this country and expect to be the president. And in fact, there were actually stories to that effect. If you go back and look, you'll find editorials like, you know, he's, whether we, whether we agree with it or not, we think this is a bridge too far and, and he's not going to, uh, he's not going to survive this. But, um, but Trump did defy it, and it, he did it in a way uh, that for reporters was, was shocking. Not only did he, um, did he survive it, but when questioned uh, about his remarks, he just flat out denied that he ever made them. He said, <laughs> I, I didn't say it. Uh, and reporters didn't know how to respond to that. It, the, how, how could he say that it, he didn't say it? It's on video. We're going to show it right, you know, right after he says it. 
Um, and, uh, and then there was another phenomenon that was very strange for a lot of us in the media, which was uh, after that strange performance, which we thought was bewildering, where he denied saying something that he clearly said, he not only didn't go down in the polls, he went up in the polls. And this, was a very, this, this should have been a signal to a lot of us in the media um, that he had an insight into the process that we didn't, uh, which was that nowadays in the modern media landscape, uh, your audiences are less and less attuned and, and they care less and less about whether or not you're right or factually accurate as long as you're telling them something that they want to hear. And Trump, Trump understood this at a level that the news media didn't. Uh, and he repeatedly defied this idea um, that we could tell him that he couldn't be president anymore because he had told a lie. Uh, we were unaware of the fact that audiences just weren't really all that interested in what we had to say about that. Now, there's a couple of other things uh, that were really interested that are really interesting about campaigning that Donald Trump saw through, and I think a lot of us didn't see through. A long time ago, I was when I again when I was watching sort of campaigning happen at this snail's pace for years and years and years. Um, I noticed that. The campaign marketing process is a very strange thing. It's, it's uh, extremely sophisticated in some ways and extremely simple-minded in other ways. If you listen to the speeches in the, in the pre-Trump era, uh, they were basically just strings of meaningless cliches piled on top of one another. Uh, and it didn't, almost didn't matter which candidate was speaking. Uh, if you took out certain words from each speech, you wouldn't be able to tell which party the person represented or what, uh, what policies he or she supported. Uh, they, just, they were just sort of anodyne, meaningless uh, phrases strung together one after the other. And just to give you a couple of examples of actual campaign rhetoric that was very common. Uh, here's one, for millions and millions of Americans, the dream, uh, millions and millions of Americans, the dream with which I grew up has been shattered. Uh, the choice is between the right change and the wrong change, between going forward and going backward. Um, this is totally meaningless, of course, uh, but within these meaningless phrases, there was actually, you know, as we found, as I found out, uh, an incredibly sophisticated marketing phenomenon. And what uh, we now know, and in fact, they actually introduced this to, to uh, consumers, um, that they were, they were using incredibly sophisticated technology to find out which words people liked more than other words. Uh, I'm sure everybody who's watched debates now and they, you'll sometimes see there's a crawl on the bottom with a little graph and when a candidate is talking you'll see it go up or down uh, and this is what they call dial survey technology and basically what they'll do is they'll get uh, a, a group, a control group into a room and they'll have the, a bunch of people sit there and they'll have a candidate read off a speech and if the people like the word they're supposed to turn the dial this way and if they don't like the word they turn, they turn it that way and what people, the people who are running these campaigns found out is that certain kinds of voters just like it. They like hearing certain kinds of words. And what they would do is they would write these speeches, which were essentially collections of words that had meaningless sentences connecting them together. Um, and so for progressive voters, uh, if you listen to speeches that are directed towards that kind of voter, you'll find that they off, very often uh, contain words like future, smart, and compassion. Uh, but for a right-wing voter, you'll often see words like family, tough, uh, work, obligation. Uh, and so what these candidates were doing, they were using this very, very advanced technology to basically lay this incredibly idiotic kind of politics on millions and millions of people. And the way I like to think of it is, they were building like the most advanced rocket in history to deliver the world's worst cheeseburger to the moon, basically. <laughs> it's just, it was very, very sophisticated marketing, very, very dumb politics. Uh, and so why is one part of the process dumb and one part of it smart? Well, the, the politics part, when you think about it, doesn't need to be smart. Uh, really, most people only have one of three choices when it comes to politics. Uh, they can either vote Democratic, they can vote Republican, or they can not vote at all. Uh, of course, interestingly, not voting at all continues to be the overwhelmingly most popular uh, choice uh, among the three. But 
the level of marketing sophistication that you need uh, to get people to make one of three choices uh, is relatively uh, simpler than it is to get people to watch a political show at all compared to everything else that's on television, right? So in other words, it's easier to get somebody to vote Democratic or Republican than it is to get a person to watch a political speech instead of Monday Night Football or Keeping Up with the Kardashians or, or porn or whatever it is that they, they watch. So as time went on, the sort of reality show aspects of campaigning the, all the trappings of, of campaigns, the, 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 the lighting, the, the, the production values, the, um, the, back, the backdrops, the scenery, all of that became more and more sophisticated over time uh, while the actual politics became more and more simplistic over time. So th what it, you ended up getting was a, an incredibly sophisticated television show about very, very unsophisticated politics. And Donald Trump's insight, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that he was a reality television star, was that not only had our politics devolved into a TV show, but it was basically a bad TV show. Um, any TV show that planned to have its leading characters be people like Jeb Bush, Scott Walker and Lindsey Graham, you know, probably needed new producers. Uh, and Donald Trump turned, he took what was, uh, you know, a television show that was constant, it had uh, drama every single day, every, something happens in the campaign every day, so it's great for reality TV format. From that perspective, there's always some kind of thing going on, there's a back and forth between the candidates. Um, but the content tended to be uh, relatively uh, non-sensational compared to Survivor or, you know, uh, uh, a Tila Tequila show or, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, uh, Flavor of Flav, Flavor of Love. Um, Donald Trump wasn't competing with other Republican candidates. He was repeating, competing with Flavor of Flav uh, and Tila Tequila. And he turned the, 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 the presidential campaign into this, this crazy, can't miss, um, uh, wild reality television show. And it, for the news media that makes its money by getting people to watch their program, this was like manna in heaven for them. Um, so, so that's one thing that, that, that he understood that, that, that other candidates didn't. Uh, he also understood how to, how to make the process more intimate and how to bring people into the process. Uh, one of the things that had happened over the years is that people, actual people, became irrelevant to this television show that we were making. Um, the way the campaign is structured, as you fly around with, with, the, with the, the press corps, you don't have enough time when you're in each city to actually talk to people. Uh, and the campaigns increasingly didn't talk to them either. They just needed people as sort of stylized backdrops. They were there to be props, basically, in a television show. They were there to, to you know, if he needed somebody to, to show that he was sort of down with construction workers or with the working person, they would have a bunch of people in hard hats up on stage. Or if, the, you know, they wanted to appeal to farmers, they would visit a farming town and, you know, be photographed, you know, hugging a farmer, but they didn't actually talk to these people. Um, and the people in the press started to fall into the trap also of just using people for quotes. We would descend en masse into these towns, we would not really spend a whole lot of time with them, and then we would uh, just hustle them for quotes. Do you like this candidate? Do you like that candidate? Oftentimes, we were looking for the, the, the people in the crowd to say a, th a certain thing, and so we would search uh, people out um, and until they actually said the quote that they were looking for, which is another very bad practice that journalists do. Uh, and people, of course, they resented it. Um, and what ended up happening was is that both politicians and the media started to lose touch with actual people. And they increasingly relied upon each other and especially upon pollsters 
to sort of take the temperature of the people out there. Uh, and if you've ever traveled in, in a campaign, it's actually li it's literally a prison once the Secret Service gets involved. Um, you can't leave uh, the group uh, after the general election campaign starts uh, because security is so tight. Uh, back, back in my first campaigns, I was a pretty heavy smoker back then. I'm not anymore, but you actually had to get uh, what they called Sherpas to leave, there were like people who carried bags for the campaigns, they would leave the group to go to stores and get cigarettes and other supplies for people because you're so cut off uh, from the actual voters uh, that you can't leave the group. And so you lose touch with what's going on. You, and what happened is over, over decades, not only do you, do you lose touch with what people are thinking, but you lose touch with the ability to, to talk to people and to understand the cues that they're saying and to uh, learn, for instance, people would, would start to rely on polls to tell them whether or not uh, voters liked or disliked this or that candidate. But polls can't tell you the difference between, say, you know, rage and mere disapproval. Um, they're, they're able to tell you that people are drifting in one way or the other, but until you get that qualitative experience of sitting down with people and really understanding what their frustrations are, you're just going to miss what's actually going on. Um, and so Trump, he took advantage of all of this. He took advantage of the fact that we were out of touch. Uh, and he used that, to, again, to help solve his own problems. What he started to do was he started to incorporate the press into his act. Uh, I remember being in, at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire, and Trump, you, as it usually happens, is there's like a, a riser in the middle of the hall, and there's a bunch of reporters and camera people, and we're stuck behind ropes like zoo animals uh, in the middle of the crowd. And Trump, he started to experiment with mentioning us in the middle of his speeches. And he would say things like, look at these people, look at these bloodsuckers. Um, they, they hate me, they, they never thought I would make it this far. They've never traveled so far for an event. Look at them, they hate you, you know. And what, would ha what happened over time was his rhetoric became more and more uh, aggressive and crowds would start to physically turn towards the, the media during his presentations and they would hiss and boo and sometimes even throw stuff and you know, occasionally like you know, little scuffles broke out and it got a little bit dangerous in there. And you know, on one level it was horrible and terrifying because it evoked images of a lot of sort of fascistic uh, uh, techniques from other sort of strongman type politicians. But on the other hand, he was also using a, sort of a, a WWE style uh, method of turning what had been a sort of supernaturally boring uh, phenomenon, which is the presidential stump speech, which is, you know, if anybody has ever been to one, if you can survive one, that's amazing. But, you know, for the press corps to be able to listen to the same speech 50 or 60 times like we do, I, I, I used to have a, a numbered cliche system. Uh, I heard one candidate's cliche so often that I knew the top 20 by heart. And uh, instead of writing down notes from his speeches, I would just have collections of numbers. It would be like three, eight, 15, 11, you know. Uh, and so Trump took this, this terrible, boring format and he turned it into this intimate, menacing, real, uh, um, uh, physical experience where the representative of the hated establishment was literally in the room uh, and that was us. Uh, and again, a lot of this, this was, this was years of the press gradually losing its ability to talk to ordinary people had turned around and allowed this fatuous New York billionaire to sell himself as closer to the common man than, than reporters. And, um, and when I talk to people who are at Trump crowds, I would ask them, um, you know, why do you, why do you feel this way or that way, or why do you like this guy? And they would say, well, he's real. He's not reading from a script, which was true, you know, unlike the other, you know, the numbered cliches, Trump literally couldn't keep, they, they would pass out his speeches, um, the, the text of what was supposed to be his speech, uh, and he would deviate from it in the second word because his attention span is so, is so uh, short 
that he, he, couldn't, he couldn't read actual prepared remarks. But people would say things to me like, he's real and you people aren't. You know, I remember one guy in, Washington, in Wisconsin saying to me, you know, I'm gonna clean up his, his speech here a little bit, but he says, basically, you jerks are always trying to tell us how to live, live our lives, but you can't change a goddamn oil filter. Uh, and, you know, he was right, he was sort of right. You know, the, the people who represent the press corps this, t tend to be the sort of a feat. Uh, again, rich for the most part because we're, you know, the people who are there, they have to be in order, in order to afford the trip. Uh, they have to come from a certain class. Uh, they're all, almost all from New York, Washington, and LA. They went to the best schools uh, and they have a certain attitude towards life. And, um, and Trump used that. Uh, and he used that to sort of bridge the gap between himself and ordinary people. And so the last thing I want to talk about is is sort of the appropriation of bogeymen. Uh, Trump did something that was really strange but interesting. And the traditional method of winning elections in this country is you get up in front of a group of people, you say to them, you know, I know you've had it hard in the last four or five years and I'm gonna tell you who to blame. And, and X, Y, Z, and then A, B, and C, they're all they're, they're to blame for your, your troubles and you know, don't, don't we hate them. And that was, that's sort of the traditional format of a campaign speech. The only difference is that there are different bogeymen on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, the, the villains tend to be immigrants, uh, you know, welfare moms, liberal professors, terrorists. They actually have a very long list uh, of villains on the other side. You know, on the, on the Democratic side, it's, it's a little bit smarter and a, a little bit more sophisticated. It's, it's corporations, it's, uh, it's health insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting is that the traditional candidate never crossed lines. They, you, you, know, you, if you were either used one group of villains or another group of villains. Trump just gobbled up all of them. He's just, uh, he's so omnivorous uh, in, in his uh, sort of, the way he approaches life in every way that he used both lists. You know, he would go to every crowd and he was all things to all people at all times. Uh, I'm against the corporations, I'm against Goldman Sachs, I'm against immigrants, I'm against this and that and the other. And whatever you hated, uh, Trump would eventually get around to it in his speech. And again, the reason that people didn't do this in the past traditionally is because the media would say, well, look, this is a contradiction. You can't be this and that because those two things don't really go together. But Trump was tuned into the fact that the people had tuned us out, that they had stopped listening to us, and that you know, all of us uh, sort of news reporters who love to correct people's spelling on Twitter and you know, or just didn't know how to fix cars, um, that what we thought about what you know his his politics didn't really matter anymore, and his ability to sort of continue to continually survive. Um, uh, the negative editorializing of the press and our attempts to sort of bounce them out of the race through this sort of seal of death episodes, which increased in frequency as the campaign went along. Uh, and as, as reporters became more and more aware of their role, their financial role in helping Trump win, we, we became more cognizant of it. You heard of things like Les Moonves of CBS. Everybody hear this? You know, he sort of famously said, Trump is bad for America, but good for business. Um, you know, as, as that kind of spread in the press, uh, well, we became more and more aggressive in our, in our editorial stance towards Trump. And that just worked to his advantage. Uh, the, the meaner we got, Trump has this uncanny ability to turn everybody in his orbit into another pro wrestling character. Uh, and when he gets up there and he says that we're, we, we're the opposition, after a while, it actually turned out to be a little bit true. We, we, you know, he, he cartoonized his own opposition. He eventually gets everybody to sort of lower themselves. You think about you know, Rubio making sort of dong jokes during the middle of uh, the debates or you know, people throwing water at each other and uh, Ted, Ted Cruz started acting like a ham. Uh, during the debate, doing impersonations from the Princess Bride, and and Ron Paul was chainsawing things in half and shooting the tax code, and um, everybody starts acting like a reality star when they're around Trump long enough, 
And, uh, and we were like that too in the news media. And what ended, ends up happening was that um, the symbiotic relationship started occurring where we paid more and more attention to him. Even, even, though, even though the things we were saying about him were negative, we never took the cameras off of him for, for a second, and we still haven't. And what is the end result of that? Uh, here's some striking statistics since the, since the, November, the election in November. Um, uh, cable news ratings are up 50% uh, at CNN. They're up 50% at Fox. Uh, they're up over 35% on MSNBC, and some programs are up higher than that on that channel. CNN expects to make over a billion dollars this year in profits. Uh, and again, what, what starts to happen after a while is that unconsciously, this, the fact that he's making everybody so much money, and, and make no mistake about it, it's the fact that, that politics has begun to eat into uh, the entertainment world and the, the profitability of entertainment and we're taking some of Hollywood's market share uh, by creating politics as this giant reality show. Um, unconsciously, the people who are covering Donald Trump, whether they know it or not, they legitimize it, the, the whole thing. And that's why you'll see periodic episodes like, you know, he gives that speech after the joint speech to Congress and um, and there's the, you know, CNN will say, you know, he became president of the United States tonight, uh, or that happens after he lobs missiles, you know, Tomahawk missiles at, at Syria, you know, Fareed Zakaria will get up and say exactly the same thing, you know, Donald Trump became president of the United States tonight, and this is a company that's making a billion dollars this year because of D Donald Trump. And so it's this, this symbiotic relationship. Um, this had been going on for a long time, it, with this, this sort of synthesis of all of these different things, the, the, the collapse in trust in news media, the declining profitability of news media, which was suddenly turned around by this candidate who suddenly made money for everybody. Nobody could make money for, for the longest time, and then suddenly everybody's making money. Um, you have to think about this when you think about how politics is covered in this country, and um, it's not just Trump, that's, that's uh, you know, so my final word of caution would be that the networks have learned, uh, and, and a lot of us in the business started to talk about this last year, that, that uh, you know, what Trump does, his total indifference to whether a thing is true or not, um, and the fact that he knows that his, his core supporters don't really care all that much, the networks have also learned that lesson too uh, in the last, year or so, they, you know, we sort of by custom and because of you know, the libel laws, which don't, you know, are incredibly weak in this country and, uh, and really don't apply all that much to public figures, um, you know, by custom we, 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 we try very, very hard to get things right and to not be careless about citing sources that aren't reliable and that sort of thing. But in the age of Trump, that's really, it's starting to go out the window everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, just as a sort of general warning, I would say, again, this whole phenomenon of, of Trump and how he's sort of unlocked, uh, he's, he's converted politics into a show, um, that has implications that go beyond Donald Trump as well. And I think everybody should just be aware um, that this is a phenomenon that has negatively impacted the entire business. Um, and everything that was bad about for-profit media in the past has gotten exponentially worse uh, in the last year. And you can expect, uh, you know, going forward that we'll see, th we'll see less and less coverage of, you know, actual things that matter, you know, environmental issues, you know, corruption and contracting in, in the military, uh, disasters like Flint, um, you know, those things will get less and less airtime, and what we'll get instead is a very heavily polarized uh, uh, media landscape where there's one set of viewers that hates this politician and one set of viewers that hates another politician, and they're all gonna, they're all gonna uh, tune in and watch, and the standards are gonna go out the window. So, um, it just in sum, I would just say, just be careful, you know, not, without commenting on any particular story, uh, that this, the, the arc of the sort of failure of our business um, has, has really steepened in the last year or so, and I think as, news cons as consumers, 
people should pay more and more attention to independent media and alternative media and worry more and more about the commercial media going forward. And thank you very much, and I would love to talk, take questions. So if you have questions, please come this way and we'll do a line back that way. Thank you, I mean, amazing talk. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the unseen kind of new levels of um, thought control, um, uh, such as Cambridge Analytica and how Trump used data mining, um, how that's even a bigger climate that we're at right now and how that's affecting us. Trump using data, I mean, all the candidates use data mining. I mean, I, I think that's, um, you know, without knowing, exa I, I can't speak to that exact uh, thing, but I know that that was a phenomenon that dated back to the, Kerry, the first Kerry Bush campaign. That was when that first really started. And um, uh, I, I, I think it's worrisome. I think the whole idea of um, targeting shaping a candidate's policies based on, the, the, on, your, on the research that you do into people's searching habits. I think that's going to be something that's more and more true going forward. They're going to be able to target political advertising to people based on what they search for in, on, uh, on the web. Uh, and all that's incredibly disturbing. I, you know, in the same way that they're, they're selling that data to, to prospective employers, so that they could, they're going to be able to tell what you what websites you look at. Uh, the idea of politicians being able to look at is just horrifying, um, and I think yeah, that's definitely something to worry about. So I was just going to see if uh, you agree with this opinion, and I think it presents a problem, and I'm wondering if you know of a uh, possible solution to it. Mm -hmm. But I like that you compared it. Uh, to him not competing with the other politicians but the reality stars because right. when he got primaried I actually said that the only way that Clinton could win is if she changed her name to Hillary Boo Boo. <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> um, but the problem is, is I feel like um, because it is so entertainment centric that it's almost kind of like uh, a lot of people like to compare like the Empire of America to Rome but then it's kind of glad it's gladiator kind of ask where I feel like it's, it's good that you, we do have these critiques and that you are addressing this, and a lot of it is actually directed at the press, even though it says president on your book. But I think a lot of people look at um, Trump and try to analyze him as a person instead of looking at the system that created him, because I feel like for him it's self-fulfilling. He, he doesn't have a clue. Like, he's, he's not right. intentionally doing this, but as long as we're giving attention to it, it's like a growing beast, and, and where's, where's it going to end? Like, how do you stop that how do you it's uh... a great question there's a couple of things that are really interesting that, I, that I'd love to talk about here first though is that um, one of the things that one of the huge weaknesses of the political press in this country is that we we always think when we see a political phenomenon we always imagine that it originates with the politician right like just to give you a, a classic example the Bernie Sanders phenomenon wasn't was all about Bernie Sanders to Washington reporters, right? It wasn't, it wasn't 13 million people expressing themselves and being upset about you know, the, their feelings about the Democratic Party. It wasn't this organic thing that rose up from the population. It was because some you know, independent socialist backbencher jumped the line and got, you know. And so they, that's the way they look. They always look at the Washington character first uh, and they don't look outward at the, at the actual people and the, and the larger s thing that's going on. Trump is, is horrible for, for that instinct because he, he concentrates so much uh, attention on, him, on his person uh, and he deflects so much attention not only from the system but from the larger forces that are going on in the population that everybody imagines that Donald Trump is the only problem and not that there have been you know, growing uh, trend towards nativism and racism in, this, in the population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, what the solution is, I think we just have to focus out more as the, at, in the media. We got to focus on systemic problems more. Um, we got to talk to people more and, and make it less about the, the fairy tale 
uh, soap opera, uh, which is the easy way to do the story. You know, that, and that's, that's why we do it, because that's easy, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think the, 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 what, what the solution is, we just got to do our jobs better, and I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, so if, if we assume that, that Trump's the nominee in 2020, which he mo most likely will be barring something um, serious like impeachment or something like that, if he is the nominee, and based on your experience and what you've seen, if this dynamic is still present where he's, he, he's, he, he is who he is, he's gladiatorial, what would be the formula for the Democrats to counter that? Should they have someone who's also like him, or should they have someone who's who's somehow a foil to him? I mean, based on what you've seen, what's the answer for the left in 2020? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, see, I, what I worry about is that, is the, I, I already hear people in Washington talking about this and saying that we have to get our own version of Trump, right? And we, we, we have to get a media figure. We got to get you know, whether it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson or Mark Zuckerberg or whoever it is, right? Like, we, we need to go that route. And what's interesting to me is that they've already forgotten the lessons, I think, of Barack Obama. Barack Obama is a diametrically opposite character to Donald Trump. He is someone who prefers, uh, you know, he's reserved, polite, he doesn't act like a re reality star. Uh, he comports himself. I mean, even though, you know, for me personally, politically, I don't agree with Obama a lot. He's been a disappointment to me in a lot of ways. Style-wise, um, he won by appealing, I think, to people's better imagination, right? And what I see in Washington is a lot of pessimism. They don't believe that, that, that uh, you know, finding a better way to communicate with people, that getting, you know, telling people that they understand what their problems are, making a sincere effort to find out why people are, are disaffected. I think that's the easiest route to winning, you know, is going out and actually finding out what's wrong and coming up with solutions that people can connect with, you know, and, um, but you won't, they won't do that. You know, I think they, they, what they're gonna do is they're gonna look at a lot of polls and they're gonna, they're gonna look at the media uh, media-centric version of how to win elections, and they're, they're going to try to do the, their own version, I think. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I started thinking about this a couple days ago um, in terms of, uh, you know, the backlash. If, if uh, Trump continues to try and dig his own grave um, and uh, put his foot in his mouth and all that other stuff, um, eventually things will start to roll um, against him, but uh, there's going to be a backlash from that in terms of all the people who support him, and it's, it'll be like, you know, why are you taking away my toy? And, um, you know, the, uh, that could be the media, that could be the Democratic Party, that could be the Republican Party, and so you might have a phenomenon where everybody's trying to be like, no, you impeach him, I don't want to impeach him, you impeach him, you know, so that they don't deal with that backlash. And I'm wondering if you've seen any signs of that, and... Um, how that would play out. Yeah, that's a good question. I, th I think actually, I, I would say that there's not a lot of hesitation about taking on Donald Trump in Washington now. I, if anything, I, I would say that there's sort of an opposite problem, which is that being against Trump has become whatever, the only thing that a lot of politicians are about now. Hmm. And I, I think the, the key to succeeding going forward is they have to have some other kind of messages in, in addition to that. Politically, going after Donald Trump doesn't seem to be anybody's problem. I mean, they're, they're, the, the knives are out in full force right now for, for Trump, uh, and they're, for, they're gunning for impeachment. There's no question about that. Except for people like Mitch McConnell. Um, well, he's a Republican, first well, of all. Well, he is, but, but, but in terms of, like, I was kind of surprised about, uh, not completely, but, you know, because he's trying to control this thing, you know? Well, look, impeachment is a, uh, it's a very extreme step. Uh, and and think, think about approving it for a member of your own party. Mm. And think about, think about doing it in this situation. You know, um, th there's a lot of political will to, to try to end Donald Trump's presidency right now. And it's, it's far higher than it's been for anybody since, since 
Bill Clinton. So I, I wouldn't say that that's a problem. I, I think there are going to be plenty of candidates who are going to want to play that role mm -hmm. of the person who took on Donald Trump. I mean, they're, they're, they're practically stepping over each other to do it. Uh, Warner, Schiff, all these people, the, the, these committee chairs are anxious to be that person in front of the camera. There's, a, there's political opportunity there. Um, the, the, problem, the problem that I see, um, you know, I just, I just worry that the, the, that the, the palace intrigue aspect of it is, has occupied so much of the Democrats' time that they're, they're not paying attention to other things. Thanks. <coughs> Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, the thing that I n noticed about the two sides of the bus, the politicians in the front and the reporters in back is that there is a, a kind of underlying logic, which is a profit incentive in both cases. And to me, that bespeaks the fact that capitalism is something that feeds off the systemic pathologies of societies. And it, right now, it seems like it's gotten to the point where it's just reached a level of death drive. And right. like, there's, there's something about the Trump phenomenon that feels like it could really just unleash some, some really pathological forces in, in our society to the point where the situation you're describing with the media is just one component of a kind of embrace of sheer irrationality. And I feel... Or, or my, my question for you is whether you think some kind of like deep and uh, systemic paradigmatic change is, is called for as, as, as part of what we're... Yeah, uh, no, I, I totally agree. I, uh, I think one of the things that I, I believe that one of the reasons that Trump happened is because people are, you know, on some level, they're screaming out for something drastically different, you know? And it's, it's uh, for a lot of people, it's an inarticulate longing, you know, for a new way to experience life. And I, and I think this sort, of, this sort of relentless heartlessness of modern American, you know, industrial capitalism, uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of really casual immorality, and, and I think it's tough for people, you know, even if they don't understand it, you know, it, 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 and... We need, I think we need something, we need to at least have somebody who's capable of opening a discussion of can we live another way in this country, you know? And that question has been suppressed at the, at the presidential level. You know, it's not really, it hasn't really been possible to have that dialogue uh, because words like, you know, socialism is of course a taboo, Bernie has made it less so, but even, you know, other ideas, you know, like, you know, there's the European, you know, guaranteed income movement, you know, like the, these really interesting thoughts, they're not, they, we, we can't entertain them because our politics are so narrow. And um, yeah, I agree with you. And, and, and just to talk about one thing about the media in terms of capitalism, uh, for ages we insulated ourselves from the profit motive problem in media by having this sort of unspoken understanding, you know, the FCC, they licensed out the airwaves to, the, to these private companies, and there was, a, there was an understanding that, that um, they would get to make all this money by having these TV stations and radio stations, but in return, they would have to do something in the public interest in terms of news. So traditionally, news was a loss leader uh, for, for te television stations, radio stations, uh, and they made their money covering sports and entertainment and other stuff, and they didn't worry about making money off the news. Well, that changed, started changing in the 80s, and now, you know, this is what you get when, when news is all about profits. It just becomes insane, uh, you know, unfactual, unobjective, and, you know, it, it's, I think it's really disturbing. Thanks. Hi, Matt. Um, today on Netflix, the Roger Stone movie debuted, and up until Trump, Roger Stone was more or less a has-been. How influential was he in the 2016 election? I'm sorry, who? The what? Roger Stone. Oh, Roger Stone. How influential was he? Um, my understanding of Roger Stone is that he's a big talker who, uh, who has less access to powerful people than he has always claimed. Um, so I don't know. You know, Roger Stone, he was an advisor to the Trump campaign. He's, uh, um, I'm really not in position to really 
to answer okay. that question very well. Okay. You know, obviously he figures a lot in this this Russia drama, depending on who you talk to. Um, but that's a you know I I couldn't speak to it because I never I haven't covered that story. So. Okay, I have a part two of this question. Sure. If the media did not cover Trump like they did, because they were concerned with the ratings. Do you think he would have gotten as far as he did? So that's a great question, but I think it goes hand in hand with a couple of things. So if, if we, as, hab as a habit, did not have um, a for-profit media, we would have a different kind of audience uh, leading into 2016. We would have a more thinking audience, we would have a more discerning audience, you know, Trump isn't something that happens overnight. It happens after decades of watching the dumbest possible television uh, and lowering your attention span to half a second. And, and I think, you know, the, the fact that nobody reads anymore, I mean, the, the, the ability to think critically about what people are looking at is a phenomenon that's been, that's been de degraded for decades. Um, and if we, if we had a different kind of media dating back decades, there's no way Donald Trump would win because he was so plainly unsuited for the job, but he was perfectly suited for what this actually was, which is a, is a television show. I mean, and, and, um, and so if we didn't have that format, he would never have been successful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Hi. So um, what the person said earlier about uh, the Democrats opening their own Trump, I was thinking that too. Like he, maybe he's going to open his own franchises like his uh, university or something, so he'll teach you uh, political <laughs> hacking. But um, you were saying stuff about being in the bullpen and um, that he uh, got the crowd to turn on you and like all this stuff for the press in general. But despite all that, I've noticed you're really objective about this guy still like you're able to look at it from many sides like you don't I get the sense you don't like Trump but you you know you can you can like kind of you can kind of see through like his tactics and like oh he's like he's like flipped it around he's like he figured out a deal for these politics so if pol if politicians are actors is uh, Donald Trump the greatest actor and can you respect his hustle as an actor well that's a tough question I mean I, I find Trump fascinating on a lot of levels, and um, and and there, you know, there's a huge question, philosophical question, with Trump, which is, did he is it, did he do this on purpose? Did he did he intend to have all these tactics work this way, or was it just a total accident of his insane narcissistic personality <laughs> that just happened to fit like a glove into the equally insane format of our presidential? system when and that's the form that's the thing I lean toward but um, you know I remember an, another New Hampshire uh, incident you probably all remember it in Manchester when um, uh, Trump said there was a woman who stood up in the crowd and said can I swear here <laughs> she says Ted Cruz is a pussy right and um, and Trump looked at the woman and he said, oh, that's terrible what she said, that's terrible, you know, you, you, shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have said that, say it again, right? <laughs> so, so she says it again and, you know, all of us in the media were watching him and you could see him thinking, he's, he's, he's thinking, if she says it, it's a six hour story, if I say it, it's a four day story, you know what I mean? And he, he paused and he thought and then he goes, she just said Ted Cruz is a pussy, right? And now there's video, right? And it rockets around the internet and obliterates everything else, you know, involved with the New Hampshire election. So Trump, I think on some level, he just, he can't help himself. Like, he, you know, if you watch his, his tweeting habits and everything, there's no way that this guy is sitting there and calculating it's a good idea to tweet about <laughs> Meryl Streep and stuff like, you know, like, no way. But he, part of it, you know, he does have some instincts that some of it is conscious. So I think it's a mix of things that, like, you, know, you know, as a reporter, you have to resist the easy interpretation that it's X, Y, or Z. I think it can be all things, you know, I think he's crazy and an actor and, you know, and a manipulator and all that stuff, so. Uh, does the bypassing disgust you or is it uh, fascinates you? Well, it's disgusting, clearly. I mean, you know, the, 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 
but it's everything you wouldn't want in a politician. But the, the you know, on some level, I, if you know, if you read the book clearly, early in the campaign, when I, I saw I saw Trump, I thought his historical role was going to be that he was going to destroy the Republican Party, because it seemed pretty clear early and early on that he was he was sort of steamrolling through the whole process almost like a like a classic farcical parody of everything, right? And he made everybody who was on stage with him look more ridiculous than he was. And on some level, on a literary level, it was kind of perfect, right? It was a perfect story. And the fact that it was people like Rubio and Jeb Bush and all of those people who were the victims of it kind of didn't make you feel so bad about it. I mean, it made it, 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 made it a much funnier story. And then, and then after the nomination, it took this incredibly dark turn where it's like, this is actually going to happen, and he's going to get elected. And um, when that started to happen, you know, then it stopped being funny, and then it started to be like insane and crazy and terrifying. And, and you know, I think that's where we are right now. So uh, I, I think I had, I had different feelings about it the whole way through. I, think, I, I would imagine everybody did. Right? Did you? Uh, <clears throat> I thought the longer he was in the race, uh, more likely he was going to win. Wow. And that was even when uh, he was with Hillary. Right. So it's like, okay, it's like one week, so he's probably going to win right. at this point. Right, right. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Well, you, it was a good, good job. Uh, thanks, Matt. I really thanks. thought your talk was excellent. Um, I might take a different kind of direction sure. on this. Uh, when I hear you discussing this issue, First of all, the idea of focusing not on the incident, but the context. But I guess the context of your profession in particular, like the fact that you're a magazine writer and not a news writer, enables you to uh, engage more of your critical thinking facilities than other people might be able to. I, I think we all have recognized that we make poor decisions when we're rushed. Right. But given that, like, I mean, like right now, I'm a professor and I have many students who uh, want their papers immediately more, they'd rather their papers be done quickly than accurately, right. given that we're all rushed for time. Yeah. What is the hope for your profession? Is there hope? Because it seems like there's a positive feedback loop that you've pointed to being a problem. Is there a point where that just, the human body cannot take any longer? Or do we you know, stand in the ruins of democracy before then? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Uh, and a scary one. No, I, I, I'm really worried about it because... Um, you know, it's, this, is, this has been a problem going back in our business for decades. And it started off really, I would say, in the mid-80s and early 90s. And it started off with seemingly small problems like the appearance of, of free alternative newspapers, right? And we, when you started to give, give, give papers away, then the internet came along and people got their ads from, you know, they didn't have to go to buy the Village Voice anymore. To, find, to, to get an apartment or put up a want ad that could just go on the internet. So that depleted, massively depleted the income streams of alternative media. And what was the first thing that newspapers cut when they stopped making a lot of money? They, stopped, they, they cut the people who only spent, who worked five or six weeks on one story, right? Uh, the first thing they cut was investigative reporting. The second thing they cut was fact checking, right? Uh, and so, you know, in the old days, you would have things like the Cincinnati Enquirer doing a 10 part series on the Chiquita Banana Company, right? And they would send these two reporters down to, to South America and they would, they would, you know, they would be very well funded to do these long investigations. And, uh, and people were, were, were psyched for that kind of stuff. They had an app, the public had an appetite for that kind of reporting. Well, now, two things have happened. Number one, the audiences don't have the attention span to devour four and 5,000 word piece, uh, articles about things. They're, they're consuming tweets, right? Uh, and the other thing is that the companies have, have found out that they don't need to do that to make money. You know, so they, they're, they've invested all their money in graphics and presentation and, uh, and the content gets smaller and smaller and, and less weighty uh, all the time. And so there's no investigations, there's no critical thinking, there's no reflection. It's just reactive and it's become like this animalistic thing almost, right? Uh, and I really worry about that because not, not only are you not getting good reporting, but you're also training your audience, right? 
to, to, to be rushed like that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sure you see it, kids who come up now, they just, they just don't have the, the uh, stomach to read through long things anymore. And I, and I think that's a serious problem. And I don't, I don't know how to fix it. Do you have an idea? I mean, I, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess in general, it just seems like like speed is kind of the enemy of democracy, although right. we seem to love speed so much. I, I don't know myself, except to just refuse to acquiesce sometimes and right, right. throw sand in the gears, I think, is a common, uh, popular way to describe it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I wish there was some way to do it, but yeah, the, uh, I think it's, you're absolutely right. Speed is a huge problem with this. And Trump was, Trump, again, Trump was perfect for this because you, you had to check Twitter every 10 seconds to see what he was up to. He was the, he's the perfect futuristic speed candidate, right? Like, you know, you could be high on something at four in the morning and he'd be changing, doing something, you know, and he, he's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very bad. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Matt. Uh, thanks for the, the talk tonight. Um, a couple of uh, observations maybe from you. Uh, can we agree that probably we don't, this, this gentleman before me was the only one who used the word all night, uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and can we agree that we, it's a myth probably in the United States that probably more closer we live in a corporate fascist state. Uh, the way you win elections also, it seems to me, is whether it's Republican or Democrat, you want the fewest people to turn out. Right. And, and the end result was that maybe there was 52 or 54% of people that voted for president, which means that the man in one got probably 25% of the total vote. Yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, the, so, yeah, I, yeah, no, I agree with the, I, I totally agree. The way, the way we elect presidents in this country has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing to do with, it's, you know, it's a very strange, Process then, and um, in the, the the degree to which people are not concerned with the lack of turnout, you know, and and aren't horrified that that uh, that neither you know beats both of the candidates, you know, by a factor of two to one. Uh, I, I lived in Russia for a long time, and they used used to be able to vote for none of the above uh, in elections, and in a couple of races, they ac it actually won. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and, you know, it's, this is really, the crazy thing is that Trump, what, what Trump did last year was almost more democratic than the other system, which is just we're going to give two sort of preordained sort of corporate funded parties um, the ability to choose between, you know, to spend a billion dollars a piece on, on a, a couple of marketing campaigns and people will get to choose between one of those two things. You know, that's not terribly democratic either, and, and um, yeah, I worry about it, for sure. Yeah. Hi, um, my question is that you said that Trump brought out the polarization that's been happening. Do we have time to unify, or um, is it too far for that? And Trump being someone that I don't, I didn't vote for, but if he were to be impeached, behind him is Pence and then behind him is Ryan. So, and I'm hard pressed to find a politician that I can really believe in regardless. Right, right. I mean, it's a great question. Um, the, the one thing I, I would worry about with the whole idea of unifying is that these, the campaigns in general have just become so have become so aggressive uh, that the idea of, you know, Democrats and Republicans ever coming together again on any, you know, or peop or the whole country feeling good about anyone who could be president, I just don't, I don't see that happening going forward. I think you're going to have one half of the country that's just furious and, uh, you know, that the template of, you know, it started with Obama, you know, the people were hysterical on the other side and now, and now we have this with, with Trump. And, um, you know, I, both both sides are are in this militaristic mode and hate each other, hating each other mode. And I I don't know. I don't think that's good either. First, I've just been asked to announce that there's there's a couple people in line, but that's the last couple questions. Um, and then my my question is that uh, as a big believer that government and policy should be deeply engaging to the broader public, is there any opportunity to pivot here when we have sort of what seems like unprecedented public attention? To is there a way to keep that without continuing to appeal to the basest interests? It's a great question. Um, you know, I I thought the Sanders movement was really amazing in a lot of ways because 
he, Sanders also, you know, he was, again, kind of opposite to all the things I was talking about. Uh, he, he's exactly what reporters mean when they talk about someone being unelectable, right? <laughs> he doesn't look good on TV. Uh, he's got a funny speaking style. He's a socialist, right? Um, and yet, there was an outpouring of support for him. And when he, when he gave speeches, he what did he talk about? He talked about inequality and you know all these actual problems. It was you know it was amazing to see America actually tuned into this for a while. Um, and uh, I thought that that was proof that you know there there is the ability of politicians to engage people on something other than on, than stupidity in this country. Um, but you know, right now, you know, it's it's hard to say. I I I I hope people get the le lessons from the Sanders uh, thing, and say that you know, being just sort of an honest politician who makes an effort to try to reach out to people, that that can be successful too. You know, is there an opportunity for the media in particular there, to? entertain more of those discussions? Well, if you look at what happened with Bernie Sanders, you'll see that even though he, he and, and Trump um, were very equivalent stories, actually, in a lot of ways. They were, they were both rebels within their own party who were taking on the part, their own party structure, but Trump got 23 times the amount of television coverage as, of Bernie Sanders. Uh, you had phenomena like you know, an empty mic stand, you know, cable, even MSNBC publishing, you know, showing uh, people waiting for Trump to speak, whereas when Sanders spoke, you know, he would, they, they wouldn't keep the cameras on him for very long. And I think, um, you know, the, the, he was still considered taboo in a lot of ways, and I, I don't think they're really past that yet. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I hmm? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, Trump's, yeah, that's it. That's good, yeah. Hi, Matt. Um, you had some negative, I think deservedly negative comments about the mainstream media. I'm most concerned about the control of information, what people can get. Now, I'm retired. I'm kind of in the position that you were in when you were writing and you had weeks and weeks and weeks to do. I'm, right. I can spend hours right. looking for things and I know how to sift through things. Uh, I'm a scientist to begin with. But I, I'm most what concerned. Kind? Huh? What kind of scientist? Environmental science. Excellent. <clears throat> <laughs> So I, I've come across things uh, on the internet that, uh, like for instance, not, not that I agree with everything he says, Lord Moncton is a tremendous speaker, um, has got completely contrary information to what everybody gets on the mainstream media about climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't get any debate about that. You don't see any of that. How do you, what's your advice on, to people on how to sift through what's on the internet <laughs> and to find the good stuff? So it's really, really hard these days um, because, because the, the standards really aren't good anywhere anymore. Um, again, as the business, because, because we've had this de huge decline in profitability in the, in the news media for years, fact checking, you know, have, it used to be in order to get anything into print, you had to go through this whole very long process. Now that's completely gone for daily, daily news writing. For magazine writing, it's mostly all gone. Uh, you know, it still exists in a few places. Our magazine still has a little bit of it. Um, but nowadays, when you're trying to decide whether somebody's a reputable news source or not, you're mostly relying on whether or not that person has a track record of caring about whether or not they're factual. Uh, you know, the institutions themselves don't really have time anymore to try to catch everything, and they don't, they don't worry about it anymore as much as they used to. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what to advise you except to say that academic journals are, tend to be more re respectable. Uh, people who will link to a primary source, uh, you know, the, that, that's always a good sign. Uh, but even things like, you know, it's, I was talking about this with a reporter the other day. In the old days, when, when a, a, a member of Congress would cite something, a fact, in a prepared remark, uh, we always felt good about using that as a, as a fact in a story. Nowadays, even, even members of Congress have no problem using unsourced material when they, when they give speeches. And, and so there's this epidemic of kind of unverified stuff 
flying around and uh, it's just become really, really hard. So the, the, I think the main piece of advice is just to read a lot on every subject and just try to see what the most common story is. You know? Just one more thing, on, on sure. the published books, uh, are the publishers still doing the fact checking? Publishers do do fact checking, but um, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it depends on the project, let's put it that way. Uh, there's, there's a legal vet for pretty much every book, um, but the, the kind of line by line thing that used to be standard in this business, uh, and it, like, you know, I used to write these six and 7,000 word features for Rolling Stone, and literally every line, you know, the sky was blue this day, they would check, you know, was it blue that day? Um, that doesn't happen anymore. In books, they're mostly concerned about what can we be sued for? Uh, and, you know, what are the major factual issues in this book? And let's just check those out. But they don't, you know, the, the little things, um, you know, it really depends on the publisher and, you know, you can't, you can't depend on somebody being, everything being vetted anymore. Um, I really appreciate your analysis of um, the corporate media and also how it's, it's not actually just about Trump, but there are these systemic problems of anti-immigration, anti-immigrants, and nationalism. And so I'm wondering, is there a practical way to look at, um, is there a profitability to um, talking about immigrants and, say, Middle Easterners who have had traditionally in the media kind of like a one-dimensional perspective, is there a way to re-portray them um, in part because it can help maybe go against that tie that has been actually set by the media historically um, that, and um, is there a way to do that in a profitable way to, to entice the corp corporate entities to be interested in that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, I would say that, you know, clearly the model is hate sells uh, and, you know, discernment doesn't. And if you look back at our recent history, uh, advertisers are terrified of being seen as, for instance, you know, back in 2003, 2004, uh, the cable networks made enormous, enormous sums of money promoting the Iraq war. And there was literally zero incentive for those companies to put a halt to the, you know, Islamophobia, to any, any of that. Um, that's, that's never going to be a money maker for the networks, you know, being, being discerning. You know, I, I would even say right now there's a thing about being anti-Russian that, uh, that, you know, you're not going to find anybody um, who's going to be willing to kind of stand up and say, hey, you know, I'm pro-Russian. Like that, that's the, there's not going to be an incentive for that. Um, I think some of the networks have tried to do a better job of that in their news coverage, but that, you know, in terms of a financial incentive, you just won't find it, unfortunately. Thank you. So a few final words. Please support us. This, is, this place is dedicated to independent media, and it is really fulfilling to us to see all of you in this room. And um, we have Sanctuary Resist t-shirts. Everyone needs one. And um, we just really want to thank Matt, because you're really a hero in the movement right now, and it's so important that you're here. Thank you so much.